Sasha is joining us from the Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory in Praga, Portugal. I think many of us know Sasha from his pioneering work on solar cell and frequency modulation KPFM back in the days. So um, now he's head of this uh, laboratory for nanostructured solar cell and interested in some of the carrier dynamics happening under the tip. And so the title of his talk will be Time Resolved Surface Photovoltage of Calcogenite Materials. Sasha, we are looking forward to hearing you. Okay, thank you, Romain, for the introduction and also for the kind invitation to, to present uh, some of our research uh, results here in this um, uh, user meeting. So uh, the title you already mentioned. Um, so my name is Sasha Zadavasa. I'm working at the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory where I lead the research group on, on nanostructured solar cells. So um, I will give in the talk here um, a quick introduction to the TRKPFM. The previous two speakers already introduced very well a lot of the aspects that are relevant. Um, and then I will present, let's say, two um, examples of application. Uh, one uh, is on copper indium gallium diselenite uh, solar cells, and the other one is on a 2D material, uh, namely indium selenite. So that, that's where the chalcogenite in the title comes from. And then finally, I will talk a little bit about artifacts in time-resolved uh, KPFM. So um, in general, we have already seen that um, uh, it's very interesting to, to measure charge carrier dynamics or ion dynamics um, uh, in, in optoelectronic devices. Um, this will provide a lot of understanding and most of the techniques that are used to, to, to measure such uh, time-resolved uh, or transient effects um, happening on a, on a macroscopic scale. Um, so it's very interesting to combine such uh, transient methods uh, with uh, nanoscale resolution and combine these time resolved techniques uh, with atomic force microscopy. And Benjamin already introduced one of the methods um, to use uh, to measure time resolved with this pump probe. Uh, we use a slightly different method that also he uh, has uh, done some research on in the past. So. Um, in general, what you have to consider that uh, many of the charge dynamic effects uh, in, in semiconductor devices, they happen at a, at a fairly short time scale. Um, so you can um, normally not resolve this in, in direct measurement as in many of the macroscopic methods um, because your, your time con um, controller, your, your um, Kelvin controller, the CPD measurement is, is happening normally on a fairly slow, uh, time scale in the, in the range of milliseconds. So if you have a process that's in the range of 100 nanoseconds or hundreds of nanoseconds, as was just shown by, um, by Benjamin, then you cannot really resolve this in, in, in real time. So um, what, what you can do then is um, to apply these pulses as was already introduced. And in, in difference to this pump probe approach that um, Benjamin just uh, introduced, we do it slightly different. We still use the pulses, but we don't really have a probe pulse. So we keep on doing pulses in a regular way. And then we just measure the average um, of the CPD. So since our uh, Kelvin controller is so slow, it will not really be able to resolve each of these trajectories here, but it will in the end give out a, an average uh, value. Nevertheless, this average value still reflects uh, in some, to some extent the, what happens um, due to the exciting and the decay of the time-resolved um, time um, uh, sequence. And, and this, in the end, by varying the, the, the pulses, the, the pulse durations, we can, we can get a, a spectrum that uh, has meaningful information. And uh, for this, you can just assume, for example, a simple uh, exponential rise and an exponential decay, um, and then do a little bit of uh, simple math and you can uh, essentially uh, estimate your, your average CPD and it contains information on, on the time constants of these uh, two processes. So maybe one more word um, in addition to what the previous speaker said about um, already about um, light. Um, so when you have a semiconductor normally at the surface, you, you find some band bending due to defect states. And, and when you shine light, these defect states can recharge and this leads to a, normally to a flattening of the band and this is observed as the surface photovoltage. If you have a, a system where you even have an interface or a buried uh, a junction, for example, as we also saw before, then 
both of these the surface and the interface can contribute to the surface photovoltaics. They can even have opposing effects. So sometimes it might be quite difficult to, to distinguish between the two. Um, but these are the effects that eventually will lead to, to the signals we observe as uh, surface photovoltaics and also, of course, as, as time resolved surface photovoltaics. <clears throat> so with this, um, I come to, to the first um, example. Um, this is on a copper indium uh, gallium diselenite solar cells and maybe a, a quick uh, introduction and motivation for these materials. So they are uh, a thin film solar cell technology. So the absorber uh, as opposed to silicon where you have about 200, 300 micrometers of absorber here, you have two microns of absorber. So 100 times thinner. Um, this is because uh, it's a direct semiconductor and therefore absorbs very well the light. And um, by varying the indium and gallium composition or the sulfur and selenium composition, you can cover a very wide uh, spectral range. So you cover the full visible spectrum, which of course is um, quite useful for making solar cells out of this material. And um, so far the best efficiency on the laboratory scale uh, has been achieved with 23.35%. Uh, um, and this is very competitive, of course, in, also in comparison to silicon um, photovoltaics. It's a, it's a fairly uh, complex stack of, of five layers um, and some, some surface treatments that are required during the fabrication. The most important part is this polycrystalline layer here with grain sizes on the order of about one micron um, uh, of this copper indium gallium diselenide. Then we have a moly back contact, uh, a buffer layer, a transparent conductive oxide window layer. So mostly we are looking in our experiments at this uh, absorber layer. So we don't have any of the top layers on top. And of course, with the grain size of one micrometer, this, these materials are ideally suited to study them by scanning probe microscopy. So in this study, um, we looked at um, the difference between materials uh, that are grown in copper poor and copper rich way. So when you, when you look at these materials, um, the best optoelectronic properties are actually found for copper poor stoichiometry, whereas the best structural properties are found for copper rich stoichiometry. And actually in a, in a, in a, in the growth process that gives you the best uh, efficiency, the best performance, you start with the copper poor, then you go through a copper rich phase, and then you fin f finish the growth with a copper poor uh, deposition. So you go through these um, uh, regimes of copper poor and copper rich during your growth process to, to optimize uh, both the electronic, up to electronic and the structural properties. If you end up with a copper rich, copper indium gallium diselenide, then you will actually lead, uh, you will get a copper selenide um, uh, secondary phases um, that normally happen on the surface here. And that can be etched away easily with the KCN etching. So this KCN etching attacks favorably the, the copper um, selenide materials. And actually the main result of this study um, was um, it combined many, many different um, characterization techniques in several groups. But the main result was that uh, this, this surface etching actually has an effect on the defect, uh, defects inside the copper indium gallium diselenide even below the surface. So it's not only a surface treatment, but it has an impact also uh, far below the surface. And our contribution um, was on, on time resolved surface photovoltaic. So we compared the copper rich and the copper poor material. And you can see here a topography image and a, and a CPD image. So this is the basics. Uh, note that these samples are fairly rough. So this is far away from nice, flat, ideal surfaces with atomic resolution. So normally our images are a few microns in size and we have surface uh, uh, height differences of a few hundred nanometers. So uh, just the, the topography scan often is, is somewhat of a challenge. So then when we, when we just put a constant illumination on it um, with a red light, which is uh, below, uh, it's above the band gap. So then we see that the surface photovoltaic increases here. And then when we switch it off, it immediately decreases. So of course, this, this way to just switch on and off light does not allow us to, to learn anything about the dynamic processes. So therefore, uh, we, we use these pulse sequences that uh, were already introduced before. So we start with very fast pulses and then go slower and slower. And we run, um, run this pulse uh, sequence here. And, and what happens then if we just observe this in real time, we see Im uh, initially a, a strong increase and then we see this, uh, this drop here. 
and of course this is as a function as we are keeping these pulses on and in in these experiments we used pulses between 100 nanoseconds and 10 milliseconds uh, period and then um, after switching off again this one this goes back to zero for, however for the copper rich uh, material um, we see a similar behavior first increase then it drops uh, during the sequence and then a sharp drop as the sequence finishes and we are in dark conditions again but it doesn't fall down to uh, to the initial zero value here um, but there's a very slow decay over over longer time and and this this long decay is due to metastable uh, defects so now the question is to analyze these these behaviors here a little bit more so we plot this a function of the period or the frequency and we see that there is this transition from, let's say, the full SPV to about half of the SPV, which is what you expect because we use a duty cycle of uh, uh, one half. So the, the average SPV it for, uh, um, for fast enough uh, uh, pulses is, is going to be uh, half, for slow enough pulses is going to be half. Um, however, as we saw already before, since this doesn't decay to zero, this also stays here at a higher uh, ratio, and this indicates the, the metastable uh, um, defects. And what we also observe is that the, the copper poor material, which is the better optoelectronic material, um, decays slower, um, whereas the, the copper rich material is about 10 times faster in this decay uh, time here. Um, and here we use the simple exponential fit. So um, there were lots of other techniques, also tr um, transient techniques uh, applied to these materials uh, in admittance, uh, spectroscopy, photoelectrochemical transients, and so on. And all our data is consistent with the metastable uh, amphoteric dye vacancy defect. So essentially what happens below the surface due to this um, etching of the copper selenides, the copper from the bulk or from the below surface region starts moving to the surface again and leaves behind uh, copper vacancies that then form this dye vacancy complex with, uh, with selenium vacancies in the material and this leads to these metastable um, effects. So coming to a, a different uh, materials class, we have already seen uh, three different kinds of solar cells today, so now something different, um, a 2D material, also very fashionable materials. And uh, specifically this is uh, indium-2 uh, selenium-3 um, material that uh, we looked here in this study. So obviously everybody knows that 2D materials are uh, quite interesting materials. They have lots of interesting and curious properties that are investigated uh, on one hand on the fundamental um, science um, level, but also always there is the, the aim to, to use these materials in applications. Um, so the, the, one of the advantages of these 2D materials, um, what many groups do uh, around the world, is they, they take uh, either crystals or they deposit small flakes on, on surfaces. Then they can transfer them by, by uh, pick and place methods in different ways and make these kind of Lego style uh, uh, new materials that, of course, don't exist in nature. And you just combine, di combine different of these um, 2D materials on top of each other and kind of design a device in this way. However, these devices are, are fabricated uh, from individual flakes and by manually transferring and stacking them. So it's a very cumbersome and time consuming technique and you get essentially one device at a time. So there's uh, some, some nice papers that show this, but it's really each, each layer has to be transferred individually and, and with high precision. So you, you spend probably a day or so on making a single device. So if you want to make actually devices that can go in, let's say, millions of cell phones, then that, that's not a very suitable uh, technology. So you need uh, processes that uh, are able, uh, that are industrially compatible to, um, to fabricate such devices. So in view of this, we are working on molecular beam epitaxy, where we evaporate um, indium and selenium um, onto a two inch uh, sapphire wafers. And here is the structure. So the indium-2 selenium-3 beta phase is essentially five atomic uh, sheets with the selenium, indium, selenium, indium, selenium. Um, and when we do this, um, we, we get uh, here an AFM image. Um, so this is for once just a simple AFM, no, no KPFM here in this one. Um, we see this atomic scale terraces, uh, each quintuple layer. Um, so these are called quintuple layers is about one nanometer and we get this uh, quintuple um, this uh, atomic layer um, 
uh, resolution here with the terraces. We also did TM to confirm that we have actually over a very large area, we get uh, almost perfect uh, crystal growth with very little defects in the material. We can control the growth. So this was a very thick layer here, 90 nanometers, but we can control the growth to about two plus minus one quintuple layers, which is shown here um, very flat uh, surfaces. So then we use this to, to make devices. So since we now have uh, um, the, the full wafer covered with the indium selenide, we can go to, to the clean room, use um, essentially etching, photolithography, um, and so on, deposit metal contacts, deposit here a protective layer on top, and we, we fabricate hundreds of these photo detector devices on a single wafer. And this is how it looks in the end. The, the wafer is full of different de uh, devices here, different sizes, and this is uh, like a light microscopy image of a single device here. In the middle, you can see the channel. So these devices have a wavelength uh, respondence with a sensitivity limit, let's say, of, of about 900 nanometers, corresponding to 1.4 electron volts, roughly. And uh, we also check the, the time dependence uh, response. So you just use a, a chopper in, in, in your illumination and you measure the photocurrent as a function of the chopper period. And then you fit this and you get a, a decay time here of, of seven milliseconds. So one of the questions when you look at these devices is when you shine light, what can happen is you generate charges that can get trapped in, in the interface defects that you obviously might have at these interfaces in your device on the substrate, but also on the other uh, additional layers. Um, and even on the edges when, when you do the etching. So um, these, these um, trapped charges can generate additional elect uh, electrostatic fields that then leads to different um, time responses of your device. Um, and uh, therefore our question was, is this, is this time constant that we measured there related to the interfaces of the device, let's say at the contacts or the transparent dielectric that we use, or is it an inherent material property of the, of the beta indium two selenium three? So that's, of course, uh, we used time resolved uh, um, surface photovoltaic uh, measurements on the bare material. So here, of course, we have the advantage. We do not need to fabricate a full device to measure a photocurrent. We can use um, the, the um, surface photovoltage to measure the time dependence. And um, we had to transfer the growth on a, on a gallium nitrite uh, covered sapphire wafer. So there's uh, commercially available epitaxial gallium nitrite on sapphire um, to have a conductive back contact uh, and, and be able to apply the, the voltage across the, the layer. And then again, we use our pulse sequence, um, again, here from 100 nanoseconds to uh, 100 milliseconds. And this is the spectrum uh, we see as a function of the frequency here. So we have uh, the decay here in, in the range of, uh, of milliseconds. So um, following um, the previous work of uh, Benjamin Gravin's group, we, we fit, uh, fit this um, dependence with a with this rather complicated looking um, equation, but in the end, it's just the, the dark value. Then we have two processes for surface photovo photovoltage. One is a, uh, one um, um, build up and two decays. Um, so these are all characterized by these time constants. And when we do this fit, we get actually a quite good match. Um, and we get these three decade, uh, this three time constants um, in, in the, here, two in the microseconds and one in the mi uh, millisecond range. So if we focus only on the process in the, in the milliseconds, we can actually get fairly good description only with single process already of our data. Um, and this time constant of 14 milliseconds is actually very close to the one of the, of the photo detector. So if you consider that this was a slightly different substrate, and uh, possibly uh, influence slightly the materials quality, then we can uh, um, fairly confidently say that the time constant of the pure material is probably the same um, as in the device. So it's likely an inherent materials process that is determining the, decay, uh, the, the time uh, response uh, of, of the photodetector device. So finally, um, I want to put uh, a few slides here on the um, uh, artifacts and time resolved uh, Kelvin probe force microscopy. Um, I see my time is not too much anymore, so I will go uh, slightly quicker. So when we do these spectra, sometimes we see these sparks here and, and um, normally we try to ignore them, but then at some point we just got interested and try to understand a little bit more these kind of things here. Here it's related probably to the resonance frequency of the cantilever. 
So we teamed up with, uh, with Santiago Solares um, that has previously done um, looking at the cantilever dynamics by, by just looking at the equation of motion of the cantilever. And here we, we now introduce the, looking at this cantilever uh, motion uh, for Kelvin probes. So we uh, again, look at these uh, three forces from, from applying a, an AC uh, voltage, nicely introduced by, by Stefan earlier in, in this morning. And, and then additionally, we put a voltage uh, perturbation. So voltage pulses, squared, squared pulses with a period P um, and a duty cycle of one half um, that can reflect bias pulses directly, but it could also reflect the, the CPD change induced by light pulses or any other perturbation that has an impact on the, on the CPD of our sample. So here is again this pulse train that we send, and this is then we only look at the electrostatic driving force, so we ignore the cantilever oscillation that is excited uh, by the PSO. Um, and this electrostatic driving force then looks actually quite complicated. And when you try to reduce, when you try to apply a compensating voltage to reduce this, you can you can actually not reduce the electrostatic uh, um, excited oscillation of the cantilever completely. Um, if you have a, a pulses at two times the AC frequency. Um, and and um, this is how we evaluate those results. So we determine the amplitude of the electrostatically excited excitation as a function of different applied biases. So this is essentially the work that our Kelvin controller normally does. And, and then we see this amplitude decreases to zero if we are um, not at two times the frequency, but if, if we are at two times the frequency of the AC voltage, we, we are not able to reduce this to zero. So we get a slightly offset minimum. This is a, a, a about 40 millivolt difference to what we would expect this at, at zero to, to, to vanish. So when we then vary the, the, the period of our pulses, then we get these spikes here that um, form that I just explained this one here, but actually we get them at at higher uh, frequencies um, as well. Um, so, and this goes uh, in, a, in a systematic way. So this is two times the, the AC frequency, and then we see it at two thirds, two fifth, and two seventh uh, of the AC frequency. Um, and this uh, can be reproduced also at uh, using um, a, um, an AC voltage of um, uh, at the second resonance, which is what we do experimentally. And we see again the same. So it's not related to the resonance, the uh, cantilever uh, fundamental resonance, but it's actually related to the AC frequency. And this uh, artifact happens at two, 2 over M times the AC frequency where M is an odd integer. And the intensity uh, decreases here. So the, the, the initial one is fairly high, but then the second one is already fairly low. So experimentally, we also observed this. We designed a, a specific experiment where we switch off the cantilever oscillation and the Z feedback so to, to try to simulate as much as possible this, the, the uh, simulation conditions. And we do actually observe this effect here at two times the, the frequency of the AC voltage, which we applied at the fundamental resonance, um, which is very typical to what you do in, in typical um, air uh, AFM setups. These Two spikes here are due to capacitive effects that we ignored. Um, actually, what you get in many experiments is not that one, but you're much more sensitive to, to, the, to the resonance frequency of your cantilever when you do bias pulsing or light pulsing, because normally you keep the set feedback switched on, and then you get some coupling between the, the cantilever oscillation due to either the, the bias or the light pulses. Um, so even the light pulse can reflect into the into the photodiode. So this normally screws up your fat, uh, Z feedback, and you, you get a much higher peak at, at this um, uh, resonance frequency that that screws up your Z feedback essentially. So finally, to conclude, um, I showed a couple of examples to measure charge dynamics um, by using uh, time-resolved KPFM or time-resolved surface photovoltage. So in the CIGS samples, we saw differences in the defects between copper rich and copper poor. In the 2D materials, we confirmed that the, the time uh, dependence of the um, photodetector devices is actually due to the material. And finally, um, the, the, the time domain spectra can be sensitive to artifacts and it's best to avoid frequencies in, in your spectrum when you run your spectrum, design your spectrum that are related to the cantilever resonances and also to the AC frequencies. So, um, just to advertise a little bit, we, we published two books with Thilo Glatzel, who will speak just after the break. 
um, but there's also a specific chapter about applying this to solar cells. Um, and then, of course, I have to thank the team, which is a quite multinational team. And these are these two are the, the people that are mainly working on the on the scanning probe. And uh, Marcel is the one that grows our excellent 2D materials. So with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Sasha. So that was a comprehensive talk and also a comprehensive analysis of all the artifact. Um, so we are basically already uh, uh, at the time for the for the pool. Um, maybe I can just ask a, a very quick question. So when you make this sequence, so you have a very uh, up and down, so zero to one pulses. Um, do you see some uh, overshoot because of these pulses or um, other effect? Um, or it doesn't matter the, the ramp, the, the speed of the ramp. So, um, well, this is a bit um, uh, related to kind of the pulse uh, generator that you use. So we use um, um, the pulse generator that's it's included in an oscilloscope. So we, uh, that limits at the moment our time resolution. And this, we use these pulses to drive uh, a fast uh, laser. Um, it's a different one than uh, Benjamin showed there, um, but which has um, a time, the lowest time pulse, uh, the pulse you get, laser pulse you can get is, uh, is three nanoseconds according to the specification. So we are a little bit uh, above that, the fastest we can go. But normally we limit it to about 100 nanoseconds in our experiments because uh, we, we don't need to go faster since we have not, uh, mm -hmm. we don't have okay. any effects at faster times. And then this, the pulse is quite, quite nicely shaped, quite square shaped in the light. Uh, but if we go to the limits of the laser, we actually see a quite large overshoot in the intensity and then it goes to the, to the, to the supposed intensity. So the, the better your laser source, the, the better your pulse shape will be. So of course it's, it's related to, to the quality of that and also to the, to the budget that you have available. So it's not just a pulse, um, generator, but also the laser source that-, that uh, Yeah, it's an electronic and a laser, yeah, a, a laser uh, problem, yes, that you, yeah. The more you invest, the better you can get your pulse, obviously. <laughs> and better resolve. Right. Well, thank you very much.